What's up, E3 members? Excited. We're honored to have Kevin Sterling Gillum here, who is the director of the museum, joining us. So thanks for joining us here. Great to have you here, Rain. Thanks for being here. Really, really excited to have you in the museum to see this remarkable place where we tell so many stories about naval aviation. We've talked a few stories so far. We're going to talk about your story in a separate podcast, which you'll have to go check out. But today, I want to talk about the EA-6B Prowler, which you have a few laps around. Yeah, I've got a little bit of time yeah. <laughs> in this airplane, so it's easy for me to talk about the EA-6B Prowler. Uh, it is the younger cousin of the A6 Intruder, which okay. is a two-seat attack airplane. The EA-6B Prowler is a four-seat version of that. It's five feet longer, 4,000 pounds heavier than the straight EA-6B. As you can see from the cockpit, there's a pilot on the, uh, in the left front seat, an electronic countermeasures officer in the right front seat, and two other electronic countermeasure officers in the, the, the two rear seats. It's ECMA 1, 2, and 3 is the four crew complement, one pilot and three naval flight officers. And the mission is airborne electronic attack, where the A6 is delivering its ordnance or the F-18. The EA-6B is designed to work the RF spectrum to take away the enemy radars that might try to do harm to our uh, strike fighter airplanes that are trying to prosecute targets. And they do that with a variety of uh, jamming pods here, the tactical jamming system pods, ALQ-99, high-speed anti-radiation missiles, which will kinetically take out a radar site and, and a host of other combinations of that. Or when I'm flying around Afghanistan, I can't talk to my wingman, I know the Prowler was up there just jamming everyone's face. Yeah, off, so, yeah. It, we try to dominate the RF spectrum. And, <laughs> and these jamming pods, as you see here, uh, can generate a lot of watts. Yeah. And you can carry up to five of them on the Prowler. And they, each one of them has two transmitters. And they're powered by a ram air turbine to give them the power they need for the long distances and high power to counter some of the modern radars that you see uh, trying to oppose our strike fighters which is an important piece and that's interesting because we'll, we'll jump in here in a minute but the little nodule out front that's the ram air turbine it is driving that energy because yep. again these things are sucking a lot of juice carrying uh tv stations underneath <laughs> their wing there you gotta feel good about sitting on top of that right well yeah there's uh there's a reason there's a gold laced canopy uh in the airplane because it's it's generating a lot a lot of uh rf energy as you kind of and those those pods, you can't see the antennas that are inside the radome, but they're steerable so that you can point at a threat and really concentrate that RF energy on the adversary radar. Yeah, it's interesting. The funny piece, I'll segue to the F-16. You know, has a pitot tube coming out yes. the center. Obviously, it's metal. You can drop the radar into spotlight, which uh, team right. is forward. So it drops the field of view down to like 10 degrees, but all that radar energy goes from 60 degrees down to 10 degrees. And supposedly all that energy gets reflected right back at you at the same, right. same power. So guys stop doing the spotlight, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like, exactly. Well, but yeah, a lot of energy is coming out of this plane. I was curious, you did mention, obviously there's four people in this yeah. jet. Is that something that you always need, or is it if you don't have all those pods on the jet, can one NFO run one pod, or do you, how does that work? Well, there are a variety of missions, and one of the things over the 48-year uh, history of the EA-6B Prowler, very adaptable. I'll give an example. In Afghanistan, not a whole lot of integrated air defenses there, uh, and so the Prowler, after the first day of um, the first night of the war post 9-11, we really didn't have any radars to take out, but we quickly found ourselves in a, in a counter comms communications and in a counter improvised explosive device uh, mission where we're using various radios to, to counter those radio uh, actuated IEDs. So. That'd be a big piece, because that's actually interesting you bring that up. You know, for aircraft adapting to what the current fight is and the right. counterinsurgency fight, it took us several years to kind of figure that piece out and that evolved over time. Right. But how this plane fit in that model and the IED portion is something that is interesting to me. It, it, it is, and a pretty versatile airplane. And Northrop Grumman did a very good job of continually upgrading the weapon system. The uh, ALQ-99 became the ALQ-218, which is now the exact same jamming system that is in the younger cousin of the Prowler, the E-18G Growler, which you know is a version of the Super Hornet with only 
two, uh, two spots, a pilot and a weapon systems operator, actually EWO, uh, electronic warfare officer, who sits in the back seat where a WIZO would normally sit to run and essentially do what two people would do before. And the pilot is obviously involved in that mission. But to your point, in the EA-6B, the two backseaters were primarily assessing the electromagnetic environment to see where the signals were and then making decisions about what to target and what to skip. The way the airplane worked, if you're a very familiar feature of the EA-6B is the football on the vertical tail. In that football are all the receivers. And the reason it's on the vertical tail, it's as far away as it can be from those powerful jammers and it's also shielded by the fuselage and the wings so that you can get clean, crisp signals into the football that receiver set in the tail, not have interference from the jamming pods, which as you mentioned, are, are just wailing away at a pretty high watt. And for those that are the uninitiated, if you will, you know, having an offensive or a defensive jamming or running a radar, depending on the aircraft, right having interference amongst these different systems is always an issue. I would imagine having the four people based on the ergonomics that was available and the technology that was right. available in this day is different. And the yeah. growler now down to two exactly. people. You and, got the Nokia. And, and I get asked that question a lot and having had the opportunity to fly both platforms, um, can, can a two seat airplane do the job of four? And I'd say, absolutely. If you look at the accoutrements in a modern block two Super Hornet, heads up display, joint helmet mounted, cured system, glass cockpit. Uh, yes, they can do it. It's busy. Right. They're very, very busy. But again, this is 60s technologies. The airplane came into service in 71 and was in service all the way to 2019 when the Marine Corps finally got out of it. So over that 48 years, the Navy and Marine Corps were constantly updating and you didn't go into a conflict area without your brother and sister ea6b pilots be it marines or uh navy and and so we've had carriers relocated not for the 44 strike fighters that are on board but for the four or five prowlers or growlers now that are on that right. flight deck that's a it's a pretty important piece when it comes yeah. to the full you know battlefield management and how you're going to take down people don't often think about that and what i liked about it i got a chance to fly a, a, a lot of different airplanes in my navy career but by far the most time I have is in this. But over the course of my career, I learned so much about the other warfare specialties because we were supporting every mission, air to air, air to ground, uh, counter ID as we talked about. Uh, and there's even a, an ISR piece, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance piece that the EA-6B could do because they had that great receiver set and four people in an airplane to, to take that data and make good decisions with it. Yeah, that's interesting to say again, because I don't think when the EA-6B was conceived that you would think it'd be in a stack with a bunch of other aircraft supporting guys on the ground who are going to go take down a high value target. Right. But you, that became an integral part of the stack and the players that went on those type missions. It, it absolutely was. And that was one of the things I was very, very proud of the, of the electronic attack community, the VAQ community because it was single-sided. We're in Whidbey Island, Washington State, the Marines from Cherry Point. And so you worked very close. And it was a small community compared to other strike fighters where a lot of fighter guys in Oceana and Lemoore, very, very tight-knit and very, very adaptive to change, to adapt to the, the threat that's there. And, and again, it was an integral part of the uh, carrier strike group to have your prowlers and now growlers in support. Important mission set. I want to jump to kind of the nuts and bolts, and I think probably starting up here with this big old nose gear. If we take a look at how does this thing get airborne? Yeah, let's take a closer look at at the Prowler from a carrier suitability piece. Again, it's a North Grumman product, Grumman Ironworks, because you really <laughs> those airplanes take a beating on the flight deck, both from the catapult shot, uh, from the the stresses imparted on the airframe and then certainly landing 46,000 pounds of airplane with five jamming pods on uh, back on the good old flight deck. It's impressive. Yeah, let's take a look. Okay, one of the big differences you'll notice with carrier-based aircraft based, as opposed to land-based aircraft is a lot of the support equipment for carrier-based aircraft is integral to the airplane. I'll give you the Prowler's boarding ladder here 
which is how the crew gets in. You can see these steps here. That goes up like that. And then there's a platform there. And all this stows so that, as you might imagine, space on an aircraft carrier is at a premium. So you don't want the flight deck littered with support equipment all around the flight deck. And for those going to the front cockpit, it's ladder, step, and then up onto the rail? Uh, well, uh, onto that little platform. There's a platform that comes down right there. And then that, you gotta raise that platform. It's a, it's a little bit of, a little bit of a struggle to get in yeah. and out of the airplane. So again, think about it. you got to kind of be an Olympian when you're on a pitching deck that probably in the weather right. and at it's, night. And it's slick and yeah. it's wet and uh, yeah, it can be fun. I always joke like doing like an eight, nine hour combat sortie is like what I didn't want to happen after doing that. Because you're in the jet an hour prior to takeoff. Jet, pretty you, much. And then by the time you get like get out of the jet, it's an extra 40 minutes. Just didn't want to fall down the ladder. Now, granted, I was going to slip off the side right. of the boat, but you know, you come back being a hero and you fall out of the jet. Like, yeah, you're not a hero anymore. Well, that's a that's a story for another day. But I've got, <laughs> I've, I've checked that box. Right, yeah, we all have. <laughs> so the other thing about a carrier-based aircraft is obviously you get airborne with a catapult, and I'll show you the landing gear system here, the catapult launch system. What you see here is the tow link. This comes down and and fits inside of what we call the catapult shuttle. And then there's a trail bar that's attached to the aft end of the nose gear. In this dog bone, uh, we call a holdback fitting. One side goes into the airplane, the other side goes into the trail bar. And when you, it allows you to go to full power and the airplane won't move. And only the force of the catapult firing uh, this separates, one side stays with the airplane, the other side stays with the uh, trail bar. Do you and know how much force is in that, that catapult? Just as a In terms of foot pounds, a lot. Yeah, I mean, I mean it is a, heavy, a lot. It's a heavy well, plane. To, to put it in perspective, you're taking a 56,000 pound airframe going from zero miles an hour to 100 and about 40 to 50 knots in 310 feet. And yeah, you'll be at full power, but that's the catapult that slings you in that right. 310 feet uh, to get you airborne. Now, one of the things that is great about an aircraft carrier is you can steam into the wind. So you'll start already with 15 to 20 knots of wind. If there's not natural wind out there, the ship can steam 15 or 20 knots and generate that wind. There's a whole science behind navigating how, where the aircraft carrier goes, what direction it has to steam in, for launch and recovery. It's pretty fascinating. I, that's pretty interesting to me, because again, I'm thinking as you launch, air, one, if you're going point A to point B, wherever you might be going, but then you have to steam for a launch period. Like how long is a launch period? Well, and, and that's where there is a premium for expeditious launch and recovery, because almost every, we call it cyclic ops, every cycle, other than the first one, where it's a launch only, but every time after that, there's a launch, immediately followed by a recovery. And it makes sense. Yep. Now I've got more airplanes off the flight deck and I can recover the previous sortie that went out. Right. Now that, I, and the landings take more room, more real estate than, than the launches. But you get three or four catapults firing on an, on an aircraft carrier, you can get 15 airplanes airborne in about nine to 10 minutes. It's wild. A, a, each catapult should fire in less than four minutes. So that's getting all this hooked up launched and then getting the airplane behind it in a position properly suited go through the myriad of checks to make sure you have the right capacity selector valve setting which adjusts the steam to be ported in that to send those pistons 310 feet down that catapult track to get you airborne and you've got to calculate the wind that you have available and some days there's not a lot of wind maybe the ship's got a casualty and they can't generate it's all catapult that's generating that that relative speed to get you the indicated airspeed that you need to get get airborne. Because I imagine even ten knots of wind, headwind, is a big difference, and probably a, there's a probably, it, it it's does, probably an exponential it does. chart. And, and that's everything from the the loads imparted on the airplane. One of the biggest penalties to aircraft structures fatigue life is the catapult shot. Because if you think about it. Yeah you're imparting a tremendous load 
along the keel of the airplane as you literally drag 58,000 pounds into the air in 310 right. feet. Right. And you get the same loads when you land. And that's the other thing about an aircraft carrier is landing. They can generate the wind over the deck such that your relative approach speed, you may have an indicated approach speed of 130 knots, 129 knots, but your closure on the carrier, let's say there's 30 knots of wind, is only 100 knots. And so that reduces the engaging speed at which the tail hook catches the uh, arresting gear wire. Is that type of data tracked or is it just? Oh, it's tracked. Is it? It's tracked. And one of the things when we talk about the newer aircraft carriers, the Gerald R. Ford class, they have electromagnetic catapults. Steam is, is good and reliable, but it's kind of plus or minus 10%. Okay. So you're trying to get an excess in speed is what the catapult officer is calculating. He knows the weight of the airplane and you've, you've verified that because me as the pilot will look out to the catapult operator who'll hold up this board that'll say 5600 and that's telling me they're setting this for 56,000 pounds, 560, it's three right. digits. And I roger that, and now I'm certifying that my airplane weighs with ordnance, with fuel, with crew, 56,000 pounds. The catapult officer is now gonna go take the wind over the deck, uh, the weight of the airplane, and calculate exactly how much steam to pour in to get me flying speed, plus some excess. They try to give you 15 knots of excess over stall speed, okay. and and because there's a the steam is a little bit plus or minus, they have to put more. So the the thing about electromagnetic catapults that is so alluring is they can get that to plus or minus one percent and not impart those uh, unnecessary loads on the airplane, which is more you can cut the margin down. Right. Here's a random question, but I've sure. seen the F-35 doing its testing. They did some intentional low energy cat shots. Yes. Can you talk to me about that? I mean, well, they do that and the folks at Patuxent River, which is where the Navy test pilot crowd hangs out, they have a whole group that's called carrier suitability. Okay. And they'll go in a Hornet or a Prowler and they'll launch and they'll keep dialing back that end speed. Well, this one's gonna be with 10 knots excess. The next one's gonna be with eight knots and the next is five, and then zero, and then one, till essentially the test pilot just says, uncle, and cries uncle. <laughs> now, if you think about it, right. you do have one advantage. You're 60 feet above the water. So you can take a little bit of uh, sink off, they call it settle off the cat, and you can get up to 20 feet of sink, and some of the test pilots are doing that until they finally go, that's as low <laughs> as we can go. And they take those calibrated weight settings and all the myriad of data, what the outside air temperature was, what the wind over the deck was. And remember, wind over the deck is a combination of the ship speed and whatever the natural wind out there. There's a misnomer that you can steam in almost any direction. If there's 10 knots of natural wind, you can't have crosswinds for the takeoffs are less sensitive to crosswinds, but the landings are very sensitive to crosswinds. So let's say the prevailing winds are coming out of the east and I'm trying to steam west to get to the central command area of responsibility. Now the ship's got to turn around and head east at whatever they need to do to get the required wind over the deck for both the launch and the recovery. Now you're steaming in the wrong direction. The cycles will be about an hour and a half, so it take you a little bit of time to launch, a little bit of time to recover. Ship turns around, starts steaming at a very fast rate of speed because those carriers, as big as they are, they can, they can motor very, very fast, steam in the other direction so you have to turn around. That's why there's such a premium on performance around the carrier to be able to get the airplanes airborne as quickly and as safely as you can and then start the recovery as quickly as you can. And it's very common to still be launching airplanes off the bow while the first couple of airplanes are landing. And it's, it's a remarkable thing to watch on board an aircraft carrier because you do all of that without saying a word. It's in a, the daytime, yeah it's all zip lip operations and you're just, you're working off visual cues, you know who you're following, you know what your interval's supposed to be and there's an airplane landing every 55 seconds. See why I like fixed runways? I'm just saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's a premium to yeah. that. But so, they can't move 400 miles right. in a day. <laughs> you save some gas that way on a jet. But with that too, 
the just the, all the moving pieces that are going on on that carrier deck. Is there someone who is orchestrating all of this movement? Are you as a pilot talking to well, there's a, control, it, as I it? like to say, it's the world's largest and most diverse team sport. You've seen all the colored uh, jerseys right. that are out there. And these are young, 18, 19 year old sailors who probably joined the Navy under police escort. Right. But they're actually working out there very hard, you know, 16, 17 hours a day. And everybody has a role based on the color of those jerseys. The yellow shirts are the ones directing the airplanes. That's the only one as the pilot that I would allow me to direct okay. the airplane around. Uh, folks in the white shirt, the landing signal officers are safety oriented. The green shirts are working on the airplanes or the catapult. Purple shirts are the grapes. They provide the fuel. And they all belong to the air boss who sits in the tower and is looking. Typically he had, there's a, a boss and a mini boss and they'll split up duties. One will take the launches and the other will take the recovery, kind of overseeing this while choreography that's going on to get 15 airplanes airborne and a like number safely back aboard. Another piece too, talking to my Navy buddies that, you know, Air Force officers, you gotta be able to land the plane. Right. But really, if you land the plane, that's pretty much it. Unless it's a large force exercise where you're recovering 60 jets, like now you're taking 3000 foot spacing, alternate sides of the runway. If it's not that scenario, then it's not as pressing. You're still gonna be, obviously you're gonna right. do everything right, be on speed, et cetera, et cetera. But talking to my Navy brethren, from the time you're coming up initial, pitching out, landing, all of that is being time graded, et cetera. It is. Every, uh, there's a lot of similarities in baseball and carrier aviation because every carrier landing that I've ever made is a graded event. That's your batting average. You either get a hit, foul ball, and you're, you're graded for each and every landing. And you do that to get better. Right. And not only is the landing graded, but the interval, the time, because I'm responsible for setting up behind the person in front of me so that I land with less than a minute interval. If I cut that too close, now the arresting gear is not set and in battery, and I get a foul deck wave off. And now I've really screwed it up because not only did I not land, I've got to go airborne and cycle myself back in. And now I'm gapping the deck by some some period of time and the air boss, the commanding officer, <laughs> the folks in the airplane with you are not happy. So there's a lot of professionalism and a tremendous amount of training that goes on in what we call a workup cycle uh, before we go on one of those long six and a half, seven and a half month deployments where we're in the central command area of responsibility. My last deployment was very interesting. We went through the Straits of Hormuz 10 separate times because oh, wow, yeah. we were prosecuting Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Freedom from the Arabian Gulf, and we were prosecuting targets in Afghanistan from the Northern Arabian Sea, which is the Northern Indian Ocean. So we were just routinely, you'd wake up the next morning in a different area of uh, responsibility. It's pretty wild. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> All right, so we, we kind of hit the, the front part of this. I would like to kind of jump back, maybe real quick, talk about the jamming pod and some sure. of the, kind of the integral what we can about yeah. what that yeah, mission you bet. site is. So. Yeah, but let's, let's take a look at it. Sounds good. The ALQ-99 jamming pod is kind of the heart and soul of the, the airplane, the weapon system, if you will. Certainly, we carry the high-speed anti-radiation missile, but this gives us great versatility. The ram air turbine that we talked about spins once you get enough airspeed over the airplane, and it powers two transmitters that have two antennas that are steerable 360 degrees uh, so that you can focus on the target. You could be pointed north and you could jam back towards the south. One thing that it was very sensitive to is angle of bank. Okay. So while you're jamming, you want to be as wings level as possible. And if you are jamming, you, you actually got to turn around at some point. Yeah. You make that as quick a turn as you possibly can. Uh, and so that's, that's the interesting thing about the jamming pods, and you can carry up to five of these. We typically carry one on the center line because there's no obstruction whatsoever with the landing gear up. And then the outboard stations, one and five, such that you don't have masking from the drop tanks. Uh, and there's whole science as to which pods go on which side with the various transmitters, right. which the technicians can swap out the various bands that we would go against high, low, mid frequencies depending on what the target set might be on a given mission. 
Yeah, and you get into a lot of geekery, for a lack of a better phrase, when it comes to this. And obviously the classification jumps pretty quick. But I think one aspect, too, is there's a lot of coordination that's going on in the cockpit. And I right. equate it to a targeting pod, a visual targeting pod. Like, there are points on F-16, F-18, F-15 that if you're flying with a targeting pod and you're flying around a target, that you're going to have to turn and potentially mask the visual target. Yep. Uh, and same uh, same concept here. So doing that coordination so you minimize. Well, interestingly, like, because... Uh, What's better than one prowler is two prowlers <laughs> on station, and you can carry twice as many pods, and you can mix those pods up. But one of the things you definitely want to coordinate is your turns. You don't want to both be in an angle of bank at the same time. So that's the type of coordination. You could do simple stuff like, hey, I'm going to turn on odd minutes, you turn on even minutes. It, a thousand different little right. tricks of the trade that we're doing just to keep the strike group fully protected and covered. Because if you happen to be in an angle of bank and your wingman's in an angle of bank, all of a sudden that strike group is very exposed and those enemy radars can zoom in on. Perfect, let's take a look at the back tail here and maybe the hook. Yep. We talked about the catapult side of it, the taking off. The landing side is equally important. The trusty tail hook, another feature, you can see how in the stow position, this fits up into the empennage of the airplane. But when you're ready to land, you drop that hook and it catches this Cross deck yeah. pendant, this arresting gear cable. So, Boom, just like that. That's a big cable. That's there. a big cable. It's actually five cables wrapped around a hemp core, essentially a rope, five cables, uh, and it's 110 feet long and it stops airplanes. Uh, in the case of the Prowler, 46,000 pound airplane going 129 miles an hour. It's wild. Brings it to a stop in 340 feet. You've used it a few times. How many times have you used it? I got 1,307 arrested <laughs> landings, but who's counting? Right, yeah. Neither here nor there. Yeah. That's awesome. Again, to me, that sounds absolutely terrifying to land on a ship, especially at night, pitching deck, in the weather. So It, it, it has its moments, but I'll have to tell you, it's one of the most rewarding things that I've done in my life is to, to be a naval aviator and spend so much time on aircraft carriers Working with the people, flying the airplanes, there's nothing like it. The night traps, I think I've had enough of those for now. <laughs> Good for that. Well, the last thing I want to talk about is really the handling characteristics and the flight controls sure. of the Prowler. So probably if we jump over here real quick, yeah, we can take a look. absolutely. The Prowler had some interesting flying characteristics, but the first thing you'll notice is Navy aircraft, the wings fold here, and that saves a lot of space on the flight deck. But once the wings are spread, You'll notice a couple of things. The, uh, there are no ailerons on the ES-6B Prowler. It's flaperons. So they turn the airplane, wait for it, by killing lift. So the airplane doesn't rotate around the centerline fuselage of the airplane. It, ro it rotates around that flaperon, which kind of makes it a little bit wobbly in that regard. It also, the speed brakes are on the wingtips. They, they open up and, uh, and it's hard to slow down this airplane with the size of the airplane and certainly carrying these jamming pods. Uh, you can go no faster than 0.86 Mach carrying those jamming pods, but you're, you're hard pressed to get that straight and level. That said, one of the really cool things about the Prowler is they had great engines. The Pratt & Whitney P408 engine is, is an upgraded version of what used to be an A4 motor. The A6 has had a slightly a P8 version, but the P4OAs generated a tremendous amount of thrust, and there are two of them. So zero to 60, the airplane's good, not a lot of top end. Right. Uh, but the flap lines made it interesting uh, as you tried to na navigate and roll the airplane. Well, you mentioned, you know, having two uh, prowlers up there, kind of counter right. rotating, kind of whatever it might be, so you always right. have continuous coverage. Yes. And doing the turns around. I translate that to F-16 doing seed with a pet shot, so a preemptive shot right. of a harm. Right. There's all sorts of different, different uh, I guess, tricks or techniques. There's a lot of geometry to, that goes into when, to, you know, when at, at what point in the track does the harm shot go off? When do you employ that harm? We would, because we had this electronic system, the receiver system, we would carry one harm and we would shoot that in what I would call a smart mode when you see a target out there, kind of a target of opportunity. Right. Whereas the F-18s would truck in harms and shoot those preemptive shots and F-16 CJs who right. did a lot of joint operations 
with our Air Force brothers and sisters. But those preemptive shots are better served from an airplane that can carry more of them and it doesn't have as good a visibility as the uh, airplane that has such good insight into what the RF spectrum looks like right. and who's jamming and who's not. Being able to really dig down into the weeds of the beeps and squeaks as we yeah. call it, having someone, because obviously the F-16 is one person sitting in there, yeah. you have to rely on technology to aggregate some of that data mm -hmm. where you might have stuff that overlaps one or another or there might be some ambiguities in there, so depending on what you see in shooting uh, might vary, but having three people or one person in a growler right. where you know exactly there's no ambiguity in what this emitter yeah. out here that we're shooting yeah at. and technology's gotten especially in the case of the 18g uh they that aoq 218 with a glass cockpit 8x10 display in the yeah. rear you could get a lot of information to the electronic weapons officer pretty quickly and they they do what they need to do with that information and a pilot's involved much more in the mission right than he was in the EA-6B. All right, if you had to wrap this thing around to get it pointed back to wherever you needed to. Depends on how high you were, okay. the higher were, the slower the turn, but you would try to carry it and the cornering speed of the airplane's pretty high. So you'd typically be going around at 400 knots okay, yeah. and bend it around and you could get, you could do a 180 depending on your loadout uh, in less than 30 seconds. So as long as your wingman is out of his turn and you're not in the same 30 seconds, you're good to go. Yeah, there's a lot happening. So There's a lot happening. Yeah. And the nice thing about the Growler is it can provide its self-protection. Typically, when we would go in harm's way, we would have a high-value escort. Uh, that would that, So these are two either F-16s or F-18s that are not carrying bombs, but essentially our guardian angels to make right. sure we don't get taken out of the fight because to lose the high-value high asset really puts the rest of the strike group at exposure. And that's, that's probably the, the nicest feature of the E18G Growler is the ability to self-protect. The self-protection piece and kind of carrying, not carrying your own weight, but being able to handle yeah. some of the problems and yeah. not always have to have someone there to make sure, okay, it's still a high value yeah. asset out there that you're- And, and the Super Hornet in general, compared to the Straight Hornet, it has those 11 weapon stations. In the E18G, two of those are given up for the receiver system, but that's still nine stations instead of four here. So you have a lot of versatility about what you can carry into the flight. And so having flown the 18G, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, what the, the younger cousin is able to do. Well, we have to catch the podcast where we're talking more about sure. Sterl's career and when we get into the growler because you have some interesting stories sure. when it comes to that. But yeah. I appreciate you taking the time walking us through that. E3 members, again, Sterl's made all this happen for us to be able to come out here and kind of get an exclusive look at some amazing things. So again, sir, thanks for taking the time Honor. and thanks for this opportunity. Oh, you bet. Honor to host you guys and look forward to having you guys come visit the museum in person. Awesome. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.